Thank you, Yaya, for coming on. We've both agreed to have a discussion on does the Bible teach that Jesus is God? I'm going to give a, a case for uh, yes, it does. You're going to give a case for the negative side. So thanks for coming on. Uh, if you'd like to introduce yourself, then feel free. Uh, salam, everyone. Uh, I hope everyone protect themselves from uh, coronavirus and uh, look uh, uh, pretty uh, uh, about uh, their family, about the, themselves, and uh, my uh, uh, my initial uh, advice is uh, don't expose yourself uh, to outside. Uh, keep protecting yourself. Keep uh, uh, taking uh, all the necessary measures uh, to not expose yourself. Uh, wash your hand. Uh, use uh, uh, protect your your breathing. Protect your mouth and. Uh, Hopefully, uh, everyone uh, be safe, and uh, hopefully, this uh, go, uh, pass soon. This difficult time. Uh, thank you, Ben, for uh, this subject. This subject is uh, Jesus is God, and uh, according to the Bible, and uh, I'm uh, trying to prove from the Bible that Jesus is not God. Uh, Jesus, peace upon him. Uh, 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 even as a Muslim, uh, I, I, don't, I, I don't rely on the Islamic teaching, but I rely on uh, uh, on uh, the Bible uh, to prove that uh, uh, God is just invisible. And I would like uh, uh, Ben to uh, to introduce uh, Jesus for us as God, and uh, uh, what the verses he rely uh, that it proves that he is God who come on earth to dwell between us. And thank you, Ben, uh, for your kindness, and uh, hope uh, everyone uh, will take in consideration uh, uh, the reference we are given and uh, apply it. And uh, maybe we all, for the sake of God, for the sake of truth, we, uh, we may uh, find the truth and uh, have the pleasure of God, which we all serve with all, all love and the kindness. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm going to begin by reading some passages from Matthew, John, Mark, and a few other places to see what the Bible actually does say about Jesus. The Bible does point to Jesus being God, which of course as a Christian I believe it does. I'll start with Matthew. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 33, it says this. This is about when they were on the boat and, and Jesus was there. Then those who, who, then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him saying, truly, you are the son of God. Now, if you're going to come and try and rebut this later on, Yaya, and say, well, that word worship there doesn't really mean worship. It means paying respect, paying homage to an important individual. Just bear in mind that the Greek word used there for worship, talking about worshiping Jesus, is the same Greek word used in Revelation chapter 11, verse 16, when talking about worshiping God. <clears throat> so just bear that in mind when we come to that verse. Now, what does John say? What does John say about Jesus? John writes in chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. He says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Now, this is the key part. All things were created through him, and without him, nothing was created that was created. So, therefore, that must then exclude Jesus himself, because if Jesus created everything that has been created, that must exclude him from creation itself. Therefore, John is pointing out here that Jesus is, in fact, creator God. Now, what does Mark say in his gospel? In Mark chapter, chapter one and, and the opening verses, he says, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. Now, what does he go on to say there? He goes on to refer back to um, Isaiah chapter 40, verse three. Now, in Isaiah 40, verse three, it says that there will be a messenger in the wilderness preparing the way for the Lord God. Now, what Mark does here, he shows that this John the Baptist, who is out there preaching in the wilderness, this is the, message, this is the messenger in the wilderness of Isaiah 40, preparing the way for the Lord God, which is Jesus. So clearly Mark, from the very get-go of his gospel, is pointing to the deity of Christ. Now, what does Thomas say? He looks at Mark, he looks at Matthew. What does Thomas say about Jesus? John chapter 20, verse 28. You have the story of after the resurrection, Jesus appeared to his disciples. But Thomas wasn't there, so Thomas didn't believe, didn't see. So then Jesus then appeared to Thomas. 
Jesus, when he saw Jesus, he said, my Lord and my God, which in the Greek language is something said like this, the Lord of me and the God of me. That would be a literal rendering of what the Greek says. But if Jesus was just a good Muslim prophet. He had to have said to Thomas, do not call me Lord and do not call me God. I'm just a prophet. I'm just a messenger. But he didn't say that. What did he say? He said, Thomas, you believe because you have seen. Blessed are those who believe and haven't seen. So Thomas doesn't get refuted. Jesus actually accepted Thomas and accepted him calling him Lord God because he is, in fact, Lord and God. So now what does Paul say? Let's move on to Paul for a moment. In Paul's writings, in Titus chapter 2, verse 13, Paul writes this. As we await the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Those words there, our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, those words, God and Saviour, don't point to two different individuals. They point to Jesus Christ. So there he's referring Jesus Christ as God and Saviour. He also writes in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8 about the uh, pre-existence of Christ. And he talks about the pre uh, the incarnation. He says, although he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God as something to grasp onto. But rather, he emptied himself and took on the form of a servant and died on the cross. So clearly, Paul is pointing out here that Jesus is God in heaven. But then he comes down from heaven in human flesh, which is what we call the incarnation. Now, Hebrews also talks strongly about the deity of Christ. I, mean, I know some Muslims might use Hebrews to try and disprove the deity of Christ, but I don't think you can do that. And if you read the very third verse of chapter one in Hebrews, chapter one, verse three says this. Jesus is the exact imprint of God's nature. Now, if he is of the same nature of God, therefore he is God. I'll ask you this, Yaya. Is any prophet of the same nature of God? No, because that would be shirk. That would be blasphemy. And since he's divine, we should see him doing and saying some divine things, which we do. For example, in Mark chapter 2, Jesus forgives sins. Now, what do the Jews say? The Jews rightly say, why does he talk like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And they're right to say that, because as a Muslim, as a Christian, we would both agree only God can forgive sins. Now, what does Jesus say? He doesn't say, hold on, guys, you've misunderstood me. I didn't really mean I was forgiven the sins. He didn't say that. But rather, he said, I say this so you know that I have the authority to forgive sins. Now, yeah, yeah, what prophet can forgive sins? I say none. I say only God can forgive sins, as the Jews said. So Jesus forgives sins. Therefore, the logical conclusion there is he must be God. Jesus makes claims to deity. For example, in John chapter 8, verse 58, he says, before Abraham was, I am. Now, you might say, well, uh, there are other people that were before Abraham. That doesn't make them God. The problem is, how did the Jews take it? They saw that as blasphemy because they knew he was claiming to be God because he used that particular title, I am, which takes us back to Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, where God says to Moses, tell Pharaoh, I am has sent you. Now, what does that mean? Jesus is clearly claiming to be the I am of Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. So therefore, he is clearly claiming to be the God of Moses. And if he's the God of Moses, then he is God, of course. Now, he also says in Isaiah, uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 17, he says, I am the first and I am the last. Which, funny enough, I, uh, yeah, yeah, is a quote we have from Isaiah chapter 44, verse 6, where God says, I am the first and I am the last. So Jesus here is doing things only God can do. He's having people worship him, which only God can accept. He's saying things only God can say. He's making claims to deity, using Old Testament names to refer to himself. Now, I would say if any prophet done this, that would be shirk, blasphemous and wrong. Yet here we have Jesus doing all of these things according to the earliest accounts of the life of Christ. Now, I'll, I'll hand over to you. Thank you for listening so patiently. Please try, uh, please try and answer the things I, I said, though. Don't go past it. Fantastic. Uh... Uh, what, what you have given us all uh, those about Jesus, what he have done and how he forgave sin and uh, how he behave, actually, uh, it doesn't make him uh, but a mediator messenger who been given authority by Almighty God to, to, give, to give 
uh, to do this kind of stuff. And Jesus, uh, I'm going to remind you, Jesus, uh, he said, I can do nothing of myself. Uh, all what I do, all what I say, it's from him, the Father. He, Jesus, he never claimed that he is the good. Jesus said, why you call me good? And you know there's only one who is good, who is God. Jesus never claimed that uh, he came to be worshipped, but he was a worshipper. Uh, Jesus, whenever done anything, he used to raise his eyes to heaven and say, thank you, Father, as you heard me. I will now, uh, Jesus, submit, Jesus, uh, worship, uh, Jesus, obey, Je Jesus, praise God, Jesus, worship God, Jesus fell on his face to worship God who sent him to the lost sheep of Israel. Jesus was not more than a messenger, and Jesus teach us who is the true God in John 17, 3. Jesus said, Jesus, the only true God is the Father who sent Jesus. And now I will give some, some reference, but before I, I will carry on uh, about Jesus, then I will give what's the difference between Jesus and God. And I hope through uh, uh, the difference between Jesus and God, you will understand my point of view. As I said, uh, Jesus, he said to Maria Magdalena, do not touch me. I didn't ascend to my father and your father, my God and your God. Uh, Jesus, if he is God, he wouldn't have a God to ascend to. Uh, Jesus teach, when you want to pray, go to your room, and pray to your father who is unseen. He didn't say, pray to me who are in front of you. He make it very direct that God is unseen. And, and John, we know that uh, John uh, uh, say that God is a spirit. A spirit have no form or, or flesh. And God is a spirit. Uh, uh, Jesus, even when uh, uh, the Jew and the Roman want to crucify him, he rely on another savior to save him. He couldn't save himself because Jesus said himself, I can do nothing of myself. When he's saying, I can do nothing of myself, that means he is showing you how much he have no power, he have no strength, he have nothing to offer to uh, to even defend himself. Jesus came came to be uh, through the Holy Spirit. Jesus was uh, given birth by uh, uh, the Virgin Maria uh, uh, Mary, who gave a birth to him. Uh, God doesn't fit to God to come. Uh, to come to to be because he ever he is everlasting. Uh, Jesus uh, came to be a create crea he came to creation uh, through a woman. That means he was uh, inside a womb for nine months, and this doesn't fit to God to be inside uh, uh, inside any uh, uh, any uh, form of life because God is above above a uh, time scale or a space or or uh, or period jesus uh, was circumcised on the eight days when he was a baby jesus a god if he is god is it fit to god to be circumcised uh, why he's not perfect if uh, god is jesus is perfect he shouldn't be circumcised at all because that's the way he was created, but uh, Jesus was circumcised. Uh, Jesus, he didn't know the hour. Uh, Jesus said, uh, not the angel, not the sons, uh, not, uh, not the son, uh, they don't know the hour, only the father knows the hour. Uh, Jesus uh, cried, out, uh, cried out when he gave up his life, according to Matthew, when he died on the cross. Uh, and uh, 
when he died, he was buried. And God, God is eternal and immortal. How can uh, God God die and be be uh, lose his life and be buried? Jesus slept, ate, drank. He grew from child, from a baby to a child to a growing man. Jesus walk around. Jesus was given authority by God to forgive sins. And he, Jesus, he said, I judge as I see. I judge not according to me, but according to the Father. Jesus said, the teaching, the teaching I give is not my own word. Not my own word, not my own action. I do exactly what the Father told me to do. And I say what the Father told me to do. Jesus was taught what to do and what to say. Jesus, uh, Jesus is a man who is, according to everyone who uh, met him, they said he is a prophet. And when he say, I am, uh, Jesus say, I am Christ. But he never say, I am God. Because Christ is the Messiah, the Savior of the lost sheep who believe in him. Now, I will, do you like to, to talk before I, I try to, to introduce uh, what's the uh, quality of God and what's the, uh, how God is? Do you like to say anything before I start? Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd firstly like to point out that you made no meaningful attempt to rebut anything I actually said. You just made a lot of points over the top of me. And then now you want to go ahead and make your opening statement. I don't think that's quite fair. So I'll quickly answer a few of the things you brought up. Of course, I can't write that fast. So I'll just touch on a few things you have brought up. Um, you said that Jesus can do nothing. He said, I can do nothing of myself. This is this is a proof of, of Jesus uh, being the second person of the Trinity. This Jesus is referring to his, um, his, uh, his joint nature with the Father. When he says that, I can do nothing of myself, that's, that, that's quite right and that's quite fitting for him to say. As the second person of the Trinity entering human flesh, it's quite fitting for him to say, I cannot do anything by myself, I can only do things with the Father. And that's because he is in fact part of the Trinity. He's not some rogue deity who's going to come down to earth and start doing his own thing. He's going to do everything in, in accordance with the perfect com uh, communion that he has with his Father. So there's really no issue there. Uh, you said Jesus um, prayed, he worshipped, and he submitted. Well, this is all absolutely acceptable because as as Jesus prayed, he, he when he comes down to earth, he's not going to become an atheist. As God's son, as the uh, eternal second person of the Trinity, he's not going to become an atheist. When he comes down here to point people to his father, he's going to be a good role model, so he's going to pray properly, he's going to worship properly, and he's going to submit to the will of his father. So there's no issue there with Jesus not being divine, divine at all. Um, the next point you made was John 17, 3. Uh, why do you start in 17, 3? Start wherever you like. Do you know what verses 1, 2, 4 and 5 say? I know. What do they say? I, I'm, I did it memorize it by heart, but okay. uh, I, I, take your I take it in consideration. And this is the problem, Yaya. Yeah, yeah. You're taking no problem. You're taking one verse, okay. you're dragging it, kicking and screaming okay. out of its context and not allowing the wider context to speak. In, okay. verse, in verses one and two, it, it's a prayer. In, in verses one and two, Jesus says um, he calls God his father yeah. and he calls himself God's son. Okay. Which, If he was just a good Muslim prophet, he couldn't say those words. Okay. You, can't, you can't believe Jesus said those words. But because he says something in the sentence after that sounds Islamic, you want to try and take that as your own, which is unfair. That's butchering the text. So in verses one and two, he calls God his father, he calls God his own son, which would be blasphemy if he's just a Muslim prophet. He goes on to say in verse five, in verse three, as you rightly say, this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God, which is true in comparison to the false gods. Now, Jesus um, then says, and this is really the nail in the coffin. Jesus then says, now, Father, give me that glory that I had with you before the world began. Now, what prophet could have glory with God before the world began? Considering we know that the Old Testament says 
that God will share his glory with no one. Here we have Jesus having glory with the Father before the world even began, which is a claim to deity. And that's what his disciples would have understood it as. But let's just bear this in mind. You've just used John 17 to try and disprove the deity of Christ. John, John's gospel has a very high Christology. And when we look at the chapters and the verses, we shouldn't think in that way because when it was originally penned down, there was no chapter or verse marks. It was just written as one continuous gospel. The, okay. chap the chapter and verse marks came later to try and help us navigate our Bibles to find things faster and easier. So if we take John as a whole, as I have already mentioned, a few chapters prior to that in John chapter 10, verse 28, Jesus says, I give eternal life. Now, let me ask you this. What prophet could give eternal life? We would both agree that only God can give eternal life. But here Jesus says, I give eternal life. That's another claim to deity. Uh, you have John chapter 6, where um, in John chapter 6, verse 44, Jesus says, no man can come to me unless the father, his father, who sent me draws them. He says, and I, Jesus, I will raise them up at the last day. So he's saying, I, Jesus, will raise them up who follow me at the last day. Now, we both agree that God can do that. If you go on later in John, John chapter 20, verse 28, Jesus accepts Thomas, calling him my Lord and my God. So to try and use John as a reference point to try and disprove the deity of Christ, I think fouls in every single aspect. So let me just, now I've dealt with John, let me deal with this. <clears throat> um, you're saying that in uh, John 20, verse 17, he says, my, I go to my God and your God. And again, I have no issue of saying that. Because although Jesus, as we believe the Bible teaches, is of the same nature, for example, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, he's the exact imprint of the nature of God, so therefore he is God. When he comes down to earth and he worships God and he points people out to their God, as he did in this passage, he has absolutely no issue. And again, that's in John 20, that you're bringing this verse up. I don't think you need verse. It's John 20, verse 17, where he says, I go to my God and your God. Literally, uh, 11 verses later, Thomas calls him Lord and God, and he accepts that. So you have to understand what Jesus is doing there. He's the God man in human flesh, pointing people to his father. There's no issue there. Uh, you also brought up um, da -da -da, pray to Jesus and not to God. Excuse me, that we should only pray to God, not to Jesus. Well, let's look at what Jesus actually says about prayer. In John 14, and again, you'd like to use John, let's stick with John. In John 14, verse 13 to 14, Jesus says these words. He says, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. So here is a clear verse pointing to that we are able to pray directly to Jesus, and we ask it in his name, he will do it. And this is shown uh, in the very next book of the Bible, in Acts chapter 7, where Stephen prays to Jesus. When Stephen's being stoned, he says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. So he prays to Jesus right before he dies. So there's no issue there. We can, in fact, pray to Jesus, and Jesus, in fact, taught us to do so. So your allegation there is, is false. Um, you said that John points to Jesus not being God. Um, I think we've already refuted that. John does, in fact, believe Jesus is God. John has a very high Christology. Uh, you're saying Jesus was created because he was uh, he came from Mary. That's the that's the uh, incarnation. But as I've already mentioned in prior texts, the Bible teaches that, uh, that Jesus existed as a second person of the Trinity before he entered Mary's womb. For example, and again, Hebrews chapter one, verse three. He is the exact imprint of the nature of God. Uh, Philippians chapter two, verses five to eight. Although he was in the form of God. He did not account quality with God, something to hold on to. But he emptied himself and took on human flesh. So therefore, he existed before he took on human flesh. There's no issue there. Um, is it fit for Jesus to be circumcised? Well, again, this is where you might not. You, I don't know how much of the Bible you studied, but we believe as Christians that because we have failed in every single aspect of the law, uh, therefore, it took Jesus, a perfect God man, to fulfill the law because let me, work, let, me, let me put it to you like this. Because I have sin and you have sin, we can't take the punishment for each other. Only uh, someone who's perfect can do that. And Jesus, being the God man, lived a perfect life for 33 something years. We couldn't live for 33 something seconds. He then died on the cross. 
And at the cross is where God's justice and mercy kiss. And it took Jesus to die on the cross because he was the only one that could fulfill God's law and therefore take our sins upon himself because he was, in fact, the perfect man. So when Jesus, what, what, um, what, why, why don't so you say... Jesus, one second. So when Jesus was circumcised, that's quite fitting for him to do because he's fulfilling the law. He's, he's fulfilling the things that need to be done prior to the crucifixion. He then goes to get baptised. There's, there's no issue there for us as Christians. Um, you then say Jesus' disciples called him a prophet. I have shown you already where Jesus' disciples called him Lord and God, where Jesus' disciples um, said that he was the creator of all things, where Jesus' disciples said that he is the exact imprint of the nature of God. I've shown you where Jesus' disciples worship God. So to say that he is just a prophet, I don't think that marries up with what the disciples actually said. Now, I've answered Yaya. I've gone for every single point I could write down you made. And I've literally answered them one by one by one. Now, if we go back to what I said earlier, you've made notes. I saw you writing. Could you then answer the things I said in my opening statement? Could you then touch upon that? And we'll have a back and forth on that. Uh, I would like to do uh, what uh, uh, I have not. Uh, you said uh, uh, Jesus, he joined nature and, with the father and joined nature. But uh uh, and, and I'm asking you to prove for me that Jesus is God through the nature of God. And now I would like uh, to, to touch on uh, what guide nature and uh, try to apply it on Jesus. Sorry, Yaya, before, before, I'm happy to do that. But before we do that, I, I've been fair to you. I've, I've made notes on everything you just said. And I literally answered them one by one as many points as I could. Um, I, I made points earlier. You made notes on your on your notepad there. I saw you. Yeah. But yeah, you've not, you've not you've not shown me the same courtesy and answered what I've said. So before we go on to your statement, I've answered your rebuttal. I've answered what you said already. Could you now answer the things I've said rather than just look past them? Because this uh, is what, this is these uh, these verses are really that the this is going to be the the uh, deciding then, factor in this in this discussion because I've brought yeah. up multiple verses and you've not actually answered any of them. I've answered all what you've said. Could you please now go back to the notes you've made on my verses and can we discuss those for a moment? Give me your thoughts on them. Ben, uh, all, all what you said, when I'm uh, uh, replying, I'm replying accordingly to your verses. Uh, when you say uh, he is the son of God, uh, my the, the question came to my mind, is the father is the son, is the father, is the son, if he is, there's only one God, or we have two distinctive, separate two gods, father okay. and son. Okay, yeah. Um, what you've done there, Yar Yar, is you've, uh, you have a misunderstanding of the Trinity. Explain. No, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't say that to, um, I don't say that to insult you, but it, it seems to me that the very fact you said that seems you don't understand what we believe. Um, because what you've just said, you believe is, there is only one God. One second, you you just asked me the question: okay. is Jesus, is Jesus the Father? Yes, I'm understanding. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that that there you're referring to an uh, an early Christological heresy that was called modalism. Now, okay. um, modalism is kind of what you just described: that one moment, for example, God appears in modes. One moment He's the Father, then He's the Son, then He's the Spirit. That's not what we believe. That's 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 talking about um, one person, one being. A Trinitarian perspective is there is one being of God existing in three persons. So the Father and the Son and the Spirit all co-eternally exist. They don't change to be uh, one moment the Son, then the Father. The Father, Son, Spirit all exist co-equally and, and, and eternally. And we see that in um, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8. We see that in John chapter 1, where he was... Uh, where he says, in the beginning was the word, the word is with God, the word was God. And in the Greek there, it's talking about a face-to-face -face relationship with God. That's how close the son is with the God, with the father, because it's like a face-to-face -face relationship. Um, again, Hebrews 1.3, he is the exact imprint of the nature of God. So I think the question you're, you're asking there shows you have a misunderstanding about what we believe. Uh, how can you explain to me how can you explain to me the saying of all the prophet, including Jesus, the Lord our God is one, and there's more 
more than one Lord. And even Jesus have a Lord, have a Father, and have uh, a God, while he is God himself. So, and Jesus will be seated on the right hand side of God, and we will end up with two separate gods. Can you explain the Trinity through the Lord our God is one? Can you please explain to me this? Okay, um, so I'm, I'm trying to understand your question. So you're asking that, can you just can you just say that again in, in, a, in, a, in a kind of okay. compressed way, just a bit more clearly, please, that's okay. All the prophet, and including Jesus, okay. he teach, he teach, the Lord our God is one. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's fine. When, when Jesus saying as well at the same time, uh, that he have a, a God himself and he have a father and he is God himself. So what I'm saying is how come we end up with a God, have another God, which he say the father is greater than the son if they are equal according to the trinity yeah. you're talking about. Okay, so I would say this, Yaya, that um, there is not two distinct gods. We believe there is one God, one being of God in, in three persons. Um, again, Hebrews, he's the exact imprint of the nature of God. If he is the exact imprint of the nature of God, he's of the same nature of God. Therefore, he is God. No prophet can be of the same nature of God. That would be shirk. Um, so when, when, the old, when the Old Testament prophets teach that there is one God and Jesus taught there's one God, yes, we believe there's one God. I, I believe that if you look at the Old Testament, you see, I don't think, I mean, I don't think the Old Testament teaches explicitly the doctrine of the Trinity. I hold to the view that the doctrine of the Trinity is revealed in between the Testaments, in the revealing of the Son and in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But I do think there are hints to the Trinity within the Old Testament. If you look at the creation account in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, um, God says there, let us make man in our image and then it goes on to say in verse 27 in in God's image he made them so in the verse before it's talking about a plurality in, in God one being three persons it then goes on to say in the singular we are made in God's image because according to Christians we believe we are made in the image of God in verse 26 of Genesis chapter 1 we see that there is a plurality in God the fact that he says that um, uh, we made man in our image. Now, we aren't made in the image of angels. We aren't made in the image of, of uh, angelic beings. We're made in the image of God. So then he goes into the singular in the next verse, that we are made in his image. So I think there are hints to Trinity in the Old Testament. Well, I think the New Testament is where the Trinity is ultimately revealed in its fullest way we can see. So when Jesus says that when, you, when Jesus worships God, he's worshipping God uh, in, in, his, in his human flesh, which is no issue there. So if, if God the Son comes down to heaven, uh, excuse me, if God the Son comes from heaven to earth, he's going to be uh, a good worshipper. He's not going to become an atheist. He's not going to become a rogue deity. He's going to okay. follow his father as he should. Because he has, he's going to continue that relationship with his father, okay. which would be through earthly means at the time, which would be prayer and worship. Okay. Uh, you didn't touch a little bit on... Uh uh, that the father is greater than the son and they are the same. Okay. Uh, when when there's a trinity, there should be equality between the uh, three uh, three person and the trinity. Yeah. But uh, but to be honest, uh, uh, Jesus worshipped the father, but the father, he glorifies the son, but he didn't worship him. Uh, uh, Jesus came to be through the Holy Spirit not the Father. Uh, Jesus received his life uh, from, from the Holy Spirit. But God, he didn't receive his spirit or his life from anyone because God is everlasting and he was before anything. Please. Right, so again, you're saying the Father was before anything. The Bible also teaches Jesus was there with the Father before everything. Again, in, in John chapter 1, verse 3, Everything that was created, it says, was created by Jesus. 
which therefore must exclude Jesus from the creation because he is the creator of the creation and everything that was created was created by him. So therefore, clearly it's talking about Jesus's pre-existence prior to him being on earth. Okay. So, we, so we do believe Jesus pre-existed, yes. Philippians, okay. cha- Philippians chapter 2, uh, he- Hebrews um, 1, 3, John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Uh, Coloss- Colossians chapter 1 teaches Jesus was pre-existent. If you read Colossians chapter, I believe it's 1, verse 16 or so, it talks about, again, as John says, that he created everything. So we believe Jesus was there before the beginning. Honestly, I put a comparison between the, the two beginning and the, the Bible, and I find it uh, offensive and odd. Uh, if I take in consideration the beginning of a Genesis, and I read it, I read it, it, it says that God, God himself, creates such and such and such and such, and uh, you have God creating for 31 verse everything on, on earth without anyone. While I read the beginning of John, I see the word even proceeding the word God. The word was with God and the word was God and with the word was with God. So somebody is with somebody which as you, you claim is that God is more than one being. Why no, and no, 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 no. allow me allow me allow me to finish. Allow me to finish. Uh, I read it, I read it, uh, and it's like this. And and the beginning of a Genesis, there's no mentioning for the word. Because God, when he says the word, he created by the word everything around him want him wanted to, to, to come to existence. So I I refuse that uh, God, he rely on the sun to create all what on earth. I refuse it because uh, I take on consideration uh, Genesis as the truth, more truthful than uh, uh, John uh, introduction of, uh, of the word to become as a Jesus at the end because okay. it create it create confusion it bring another another deity with almighty god and it rely it take actually the power from the the father the creator and give it to the son who are created and as i mentioned to you jesus the son he received and he granted his life by the Holy Spirit, if I consider the Holy Spirit is God the Father, that means they are giving him uh, the chance to exist. So he didn't exist before that. I, so, I, you, you, can, you can answer. Okay, great. So I would say that you're saying that, um, and, and you said a lot there, I'm trying to remember exactly what you said at the beginning. Um, so you're saying that, that Jesus wasn't there in the beginning, this, that, and the other. You say that you believe Genesis is is more true. Okay, if Genesis is true, yeah. Let me ask you this: as a Muslim, are we made in the image of God? Uh, don't, don't, don't go into a long conversation. I just want to yes or no, so I can pick up. Because no, 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 because uh, according to the Bible, uh, nobody can see God and nobody seeing God. And if we are making as the image of God. Uh, why? Why didn't God show Himself to Moses? He 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 revealed God was. It says in the Bible that a fullness of deity tw- dwelled in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus said in His own words, "If you have seen Me, you have seen the Father." Okay. Which, mean, which means, if you have seen Me, you have seen God, who Jesus is God. Now, my question, my, my question, Ben, so ben my question. No, no, no. You haven't answered my question. So, do you believe we are made in the image of God? Yes or no? Just yes no, or no. No. Okay. So then you can't believe Genesis is true. So you're trying to use Genesis saying it's true when it suits you, but when it doesn't suit you, therefore it, it's then not again true. You, so you know Gen- why? You know Gen- why? Genesis Genesis chapter one says that um, we are made in the image of God. It says, let, uh, let us, this is God speaking, let us make man in our image. It says that Jesus I, is expressed. I believe, I believe that God. No, one second. It says that Jesus was the expressed uh, nature, the expressed image of God, according to Hebrews three. So we can see here that we clearly are made in the image of God. Jesus uh, comes uh, and reveals that to us. I will give you the uh, contradiction of this, because if 
God is Jesus, he could, when Moses asked him to show his face, he could show him the face of Jesus and we end up and uh, and it's okay. But God is invisible. Nobody seen his form or his shape. And this is according to John. Uh, something else, in Exodus, in Exodus 23, no other God before me. Do not take any image from heaven or earth and say that this is the image of God. Why? Uh, and one, uh, uh, the teaching of Paul, one, I, I didn't finish. Uh, one, one uh, call, one, uh, Colinius, Colinius uh, 115, uh, it says that the sun is the image and form of a human. And God ascended to heaven in a human form, and God on earth was on earth in a human flesh form. That means it's contradiction to the Exodus 23, where God say, you shall not make yourself a graven image or, or any sign likeness and to worship it. Okay. And so uh, you got again, my point, yeah? I, I understand what you're saying, but I think you're false in what you're saying. When it says there, do not make an image and say that this is God, I think you've I think you've misquoted it, but when it when I know what you're trying to say. When it says do not make this the image of God and say this is God, that's talking about making idols. That's not talking about the pre incarnate son. Now you're saying that the God, why didn't he show himself to Moses? Nobody's seen God. Jesus says, um, nobody's seen God, only he has seen God, and he reveals God. He says, If you have seen me, you have seen the Father, which means if you've seen me, you have seen God. Now, God did, in fact, reveal himself to, um, to certain people in the Old Testament. In, uh, we believe this is what we call Christophany, a pre-incarnate image of Christ. For example, if you read uh, Genesis chapter 18. OK, so we had some technical difficulty. If for some reason, we, well, I'll continue where I left off. Yeah, we do, in fact, see Yahya, um, a pre-incarnate pre uh, vision of Christ in Genesis chapter 18. We see that um, the, it says that the Lord appeared to Abraham. So we see that this is, in fact, a pre-incarnate vision of Christ. And um, I'm trying to remember where we left off. Maybe you can remember. Uh, let, let me let, let me come to it, because uh, actually uh, we say we say that uh, the Bible is corrupted because why we say the Bible is corrupted, because there's always there's two messages one say something and the other one is contradicting it. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to give you now a reference. Uh, God can, can be seen according to the Bible. Exodus 24, 9, 11, 33, 23, 33 and 11. Amos 9, 1. And Genesis 32, 30. Genesis 26, 2, and John 14, verse number 9. God can be seen. And now, in the same Bible, in John 1, 18, it says, no man has seen God at any time. And John 4, 24, God is the spirit. And no one is able to see spirit because the spirit have no form or shape. As well, in Exodus 33, verse number 20, he said, Though can not see my face, for there shall no man see my face and live. And we end up with 1 Timothy 15, 16. God at the end of the verses, whom no man has seen nor can see. So uh, the Bible, uh, on one part, he tell you no one can see God and live. And another part, he tell you that some people, like Moses, have seen God and live. And even in the case of Jacob, while, while in this is now the nature of God, the nature of God, that God... 
Can I respond? Do you want to say something? I'd like to respond, yeah. Okay. Um, this all comes back to a misunderstanding that you have. You don't understand the doctrine of the Trinity. You don't understand the Incarnation. So when it says that uh, no one can see God's face and live and things like this, um, this is talking about seeing the full, the full-on glory of God, which, of course, no man can see in a God in his, in his full glory. So when Jesus come to earth, we believe his glory was vowed in the person of his son, Jesus. It's because when Jesus walked down the street, he wasn't glowing this you know, bright glow. The birds wasn't following him from behind, tweeting nice songs. He looked like a man. But yeah, Jesus says, if you have seen me, you have seen God, because Jesus is God. He came from the Father. As Hebrews 1, 3 says again, he is of the exact imprint of the nature of God. I don't know why you're struggling to understand that. It's why, why, why then? Why and, then? And back to your back to your point. You said you said the Bible's corrupted. Yes. Yes. Can you prove that? Uh, I already give you the reference that the same Bible somewhere say God can be seen, and the same Bible it deny not. that God be seen. And as long that, as what? Well, hold on, hold on. As long as God can be seen. Why God didn't allow Moses to see him face to face in the form of Jesus? And when God, you say that he come to Abraham, did he come to Abraham in the form of Jesus, in the form of the son, even he wasn't born at that time? Or what kind of form? God, the one you believe is God the Father, what kind of form he come with? And okay. as I said, God is a spirit. God is not in the shape or form. Okay, so you, you, what you just said there isn't corruption. You're trying to point out contradictions. When if you actually read the Bible within the context of what those verses are speaking about, if you read it within its context, suddenly all these, contradiction, all these contradictions then disappear, ironically, because you have to read them in context. Now, again, you're, you're making a big claim the Bible is corrupted. Prove to me the Bible's corrupted. Give me manuscript evidence of the Bible's corruption. Okay. Okay. And if you bring up 1 John 5, 7, that's that's a textual variant, and I'll deal with that. Uh, show me corruption. And, and let's bear this in mind. Does does the Quran, before you answer my first question, does the Quran not say that Christians are to judge by what they has been revealed to them? Yes? It does. Okay, if it does, let's bear this in mind. This is this is key. If it does, then that must mean that the Christians of the time of Muhammad must have had the correct gospel to read. Yes. And if, if, if it means that, if it means they would have had the correct gospel to read from, because otherwise, what's the point in telling them to judge by what they're in? If, they're te if, if that's true, we know what the Christians were reading in the seventh century. It's the same Bible they were reading in the fifth century. The fourth century, the third century. It's the same Bible we're reading in the twenty-first century. So may I, res may if, I respond? If we are to judge by what's therein, then we ought to um, reject Muhammad's so-called revelation. Okay. I, I will then allow me to to do two things. I will talk about uh, God nature, which uh, proves that Jesus is not God, uh, and very uh, very quick. Then I answer that. No, you, you've, already, you've already spoke about the nature, so I want you to answer my question about the Bible being corrupted. Give me, give me proof. And if it is corrupted, then what's the point of Allah saying that the Christians should judge by what's therein? Because we know what we know what manuscripts the Christians had in the seventh century. Okay, uh, put it on post. Uh, hold on one second, because uh, I don't want to uh, bring too many subjects to the one subject we have. You know, uh, this you is know, different subject, to Ben. Know no, it, it, it's, and it's, it's not a small it, subject to talk about. No, but you did you did say the Bible was corrupted. So if you're going to make I, that, I did say if, that. I did say that. I will, I will bring. And if you're going to make that, if you're going to make that claim, at least defend the claim you made. Okay. Okay. Uh, when the prophet and Quran talk about the gospel, is talking about the gospel of Jesus and his teaching. Not about the four gospel, which contain contradiction and confusion, and each one saying something. Uh, uh, Jesus, Jesus, he come to carry on as observer of the law, which 
Paul who makes the law is a curse and make Jesus as a curse for everyone. And this is the corruption of the Bible. When, when Paul come and he start to write down uh, that he's servant of Jesus and going with his teaching against the law of Moses and the law which being observed to be keep the commandment of, of the law of Moses which Jesus come to to not destroy and abolish while Paul is abolish everyone and this is enough corruption in the Bible and Prophet Muhammad and Quran is talking about uh, uh, the scripture being revealed to Moses and to uh, to Jesus Jaya, can you hear me? Oh, I think so. So go uh, again. So you, you said, one second. So Yaya, you said that Paul came along and corrupted. Yes? Yes. Okay. So we know, I mean, let, let, let's just bear this in mind. What you're saying there, if Paul came along and corrupted the Bible, you're presupposing that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John was written before Paul's writings. Maria, That's can you give me my orange book? It that, might be said. If you're saying Paul corrupted the Gospels and just tried to make Jesus seem to be God, then then what you're doing there, you're presupposing that, Ma that Matthew, Mark, Luke and John came before Paul. When in reality, Paul's epistles were written before the Gospels and the Gospels were written after. So the, the Gospels that were written after actually agree with Paul's writings, which came before. The argument there doesn't work. Let, let me show you how it worked, okay? Uh, Jesus, this is the teaching of Jesus about uh, his apostle, that he always accuses them of being dull and stupid, and they never understand he, his parable. Uh, we take, a write down Mark 4:13. Let me go. Let me go there, and we'll do all that as we go. Yeah. Uh, write it down. Write it down because I'm gonna give you Mark. I'm gonna give you Luke. I'm gonna give you Matthew, and I'm gonna give you John. That Jesus, among his apostles, he considering them stupid people who never understand what he's teaching, and he have to explain every time he say any parable. Okay. Okay, so let's let can let me read Mark 4 15 first. Mark, Mark 4 15. 4 13. 13. Yeah. Okay. He said, Do you not understand all the parables? Yes. What does that have to do with the Bible being corrupted? He's saying that they don't understand the parables he's trying to teach. That doesn't mean the Bible's then corrupted. Perfect. How does that make sense? What you're relying on is that uh, the people who write, wrote the gospel, they are the one supposed to be the friend of the companion of Jesus. And as long as, long as they wrote the gospel after they, uh, they pass out of Jesus, uh, even at the time when he was with them, they couldn't understand whatever he was teaching. And... 40, 50 years after they are writing the gospel, which each gospel uh, says something different about, uh, about, and you claim that uh, the gospel is inspiration, inspiration by the Holy Spirit. Okay. And now I, yeah. I, will, I, will, I will open. Yeah, sure. One second. But yeah, yeah, you're saying that we can't trust the disciples of Jesus because he said they didn't understand the parables. So we can't trust them because of that. But you want to trust someone who comes 600 years after who didn't know Jesus and who wasn't a disciple, which makes more sense to trust the people who were there or to trust a man in another country, another language who wasn't there. Do you, you want me to do you yeah. want me to respond? Let's be consistent. Do you want me to respond? Absolutely. OK, uh, I think, yeah, yeah, by the way, I think we're going to go for another five minutes because the video is going on too long. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is what I'm saying. You now we are talking about not the nature of God, not the nature of Jesus. Oh, no, and I'm telling you, uh, the nature of God is invisible, immortal, eternal, everlasting, and seen. It does all tie in because uh, it, hold it, on, hold on. Jesus is 
came to be born out of a woman. He was circumcised. He was seen. He was dwell about everyone. He's like everyone. God is like none of his creation. Is immortal. Jesus died and he gave up his spirit on the cross according to you. How can he be God? I don't understand. And okay, let me answer that point. Okay. Okay. So and, and let me go back to my previous point just to so you understand. It does tie in with the Bible being corrupted, and let's bear in mind you brought that up, not me. Um, I was asking you to defend the claim you made. I'm, I'm going to defend it now. And you're saying Jesus died, therefore he can't be God. And again, bear this in mind, we believe in that Jesus had two natures, a human nature and a divine nature. Um, so you also believe, for example, that the Quran is the eternal word of Allah. Now, we also, I have a Quran in, in, my, in my room out there. So if I was to burn the Quran, which I'm not trying to do, if I was to burn the Quran, it wouldn't therefore make sense to say the eternal word of Allah therefore no longer exists and it's burned up. And it doesn't make sense to say because the, the, the human nature of Jesus died on the cross, it doesn't then logically follow to say that the divine nature ceased to exist. Because what you're, the argument you're really trying to make there is that death means non-existence, which none of us believe. Uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you what, we've gone on for a while now. Uh, you, you, I'll, I'll let you... I'll let you have the last word, and I'll have my last word, and then okay. we'll, we'll say God bless and good night. If, if I am a person with a split personality, they will take me uh, to the mental hospital, and they will put me in madhouse. How can you explain that your God have two personality or three personality, and he's still fit to be worshipped, even among the three person, one is relying on another for his teaching, for his everything, for his saving. And uh, you claim that Jesus, the guy who was circumcised as a child and who was born a, a, of a woman, he is a God and he will be seated at the right hand side of the mighty God. Ha, you end up with the three gods, one as a form of a dove, one in the form of a, a man who will sit on the right hand of God. Uh, uh, and Jesus teach you, the Lord our God is one, and you come with a, a demonic, shaitanic uh, uh, expression that this trinity will, will, will uh, uh, remove you from salvation because God doesn't die. God everlasting. God God doesn't start uh, a, a new nature and Jesus has uh, a will by himself and the father has a will of his own. So even their will is different and one of them have to submit to another. So which one, why don't the father submit to the will of, of the son if he's uh, as equal as you say? Why the father never worship the son as he is God himself? Okay, that's your last. That's your last statement. Yes. 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 Okay. Uh, I'm not going to try and rebut it because I think we've already gone over that maybe two or three times already. There's no point in me repeating myself. I'll just finish. By, I'll just finish by saying that if you, we look back at everything I've already said, Hebrews one three, Jesus is the exact imprint of the nature of God, which no prophet could be. That would be shirk. That points to Jesus' deity. All the disciples pointed to Jesus' deity, they called him God, they worshipped him as God. Jesus claimed to be God when he quoted Isaiah 44 verse 6. He claimed to be God when he quoted John 8 58 and applied those two names to himself. Um, Exodus 3 14 rather, sorry. Uh, he, he applied all those things to himself. Jesus done things only God can do. He forgave sins. He, uh, he calmed the storm. He even, even nature itself bow down to Jesus when he said, you know, to the wind, uh, to the storm, cease, it stopped, it, it done as it was told. Uh, the whole entire New Testament and the Bible points to Jesus being God. There's no way around that. And I think ultimately we have to, ultimately we have to let the viewers decide who made the stronger case. But uh, yeah, I've really enjoyed speaking to you. Thank you for your patience and your time, even through the technical difficulties. Uh, thanks a lot. And I uh, hope to see you soon at Speaker's Corner. And, uh, Take care and God bless. Thank you very much. Take care.